Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, A Vision for Crop Improvement and Food Security in a Changing Climate. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of the controls. <clears throat> First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who the question is for. Feel free to upvote questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the event. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrolinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Angela Records. Thank you, Michael, and greetings, everyone. I'm Angela Records. I'm a science advisor in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and deputy lead for the Bureau's research community of practice. I will serve as a moderator for Q&A session that follows the presentations today. But first, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers, starting with Nora Lapitan. The Nora Lapitan is the lead for the Research Community of Practice in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. In this role, she oversees the Bureau's Feed the Future research portfolio. Um, Nora also leads the Input Systems Division within the Center for Agriculture-Led Growth, which supports the development of innovations and technologies from agriculture research and the creation of delivery pathways for those innovations. Allison Bentley is the director of CIMIT's Global Wheat Program. Her research combines genetics and genomics to develop and deliver new tools and technology to improve plant breeding, crop production, and adaptation to climate change. Charlie Messina is professor of predictive breeding in the Department of Horticultural Sciences at the University of Florida. His program focuses on the development of prediction methods for agriculture and horticulture with a strong emphasis on genome to phenome modeling for prediction of properties of complex traits, improvement of crop adaptation to current and future climates, and enablement of circularity in horticulture. Uh, Jeff Morris is an assistant professor of crop quantitative genomics at Colorado State University. His re research focuses on climate resilience in sorghum and its relatives, mapping the genomic variants that underlie crop adaptation and developing new approaches to understand and predict climate resilience. Tony Gathungu is the global head of Seeds to Be for the Syngenta Foundation. Seeds to Be helps farmers access quality, affordable seeds of improved varieties for the crops they need. Mr. Gathungu also leads the strategy or leads the strategy and long-term planning for Seeds to Be in Africa and Asia, including exploring new institutional arrangements for scaling and developing new partnerships. And Mark Edge is Bayer's uh, Director of Partnerships, Seeds and Traits Business Development for low and middle income countries. He leads Bayer's collaborations with public-private partnership projects to get innovative, improved seeds and traits to smallholder farmers in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. I will now turn the stage over to Dr. Nora Lapitan. Thank you, Angela. Greetings, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. The purpose of this webinar is to get community input, your input, to help the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security design new research projects to address the challenges brought about by climate change and the productivity of cereal crops while also mitigating contributions of crop production to greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. This event is timely. In October last year, USAID launched the new Global Food Security Strategy that aligns with the Global Food Security Act, passed in 2016 and reauthorized in 2018. USAID and USDA are now co-leading the development of a new global food security research strategy to align with the new GFSS. 
and we have shared a draft annotated outline of the global food security research strategy in AgriLinks for community input until tomorrow. So if you have not provided input yet and want to do so, there's still time and you'll see the link in the chat. The global food security research strategy outlines three priorities that research is best positioned to address to support the Feed the Future's overall goal of reducing poverty and hunger and child stunting by 20%. These priorities include climate change, diet quality and affordability, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide, please. According to the 2021 data from the World Bank, Nearly one out of 10 people in the world live, live below the poverty line of $1.90 a day. So they're in extreme poverty. And as you see from that graph, while the global poverty rates have been decreasing up until 2019, this declining trend reversed in 2020, mainly due to the COVID-19 pandemic and pushed an extra 100 million people to extreme poverty. You also see from the graph that most of the poor are concentrated in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And two thirds of the world's poorest are located in rural areas who depend on agriculture for their food and livelihood. Climate change will impact the, the, the poor populations the hardest. New research estimates that climate change could drive up to an extra 130 million people into extreme poverty by 2030. Next slide, please. Extreme poverty is also correlated with child stunting. This slide shows the rates of undernutrition for children under five around the world. And as you can see, the highest Rates of undernutrition are concentrated in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Currently, over 20% of children under five are stunted. And it's predicted that due to climate change, increased rates of, ch of child, the rates of child stunting will increase especially because of the impact of climate change to um, decreasing incomes and higher food prices. Next slide, please. Increasing agricultural productivity is critical to reduction of poverty and child stunting. Past studies have shown that agricultural productivity is four times more effective in reducing poverty compared to other sectors. And this is especially true for low income countries. And this graph, taken from a 2019 World Bank study, further confirmed this finding. Since the 1960s, you'll see in this graph, there has been an enormous growth in agriculture productivity shown in the black line. And with that, prices of commodities have come down. And this benefited low-income groups the most, both rural and both in rural and urban areas. Because the poorer people are, the more of their income is spent on food. And so making cheap, making food more affordable leads to real, uh, increase real incomes for the poor. There's another thing that I'd like to note here. You see in the orange line in the bottom, that's for the cropland, you'll see that growth in productivity occurred with only a modest expansion of land. And so increased productivity is also critical to achieving environmental goals. Next slide, please. Research is a primary driver of agricultural productivity. Earlier growth in production has come from the expansion of land, but in the last 50 years, Enormous gains in productivity have come from science and innovation. The total outputs 
from the combined inputs is known as total factor productivity or TFP. And TFP comes from, in, um, comes from cost reducing innovations, including improved knowledge and practices and improved technologies such as high yielding, pest and disease resistant and resource use efficient crop varieties. This is the kind of innovation that we need to sustainably increase agricultural productivity without compromising the quality of the environment. And science and technology have a lot to offer in addressing the challenges brought about by climate change. Next slide, please. There are several ways that climate change could impact crop productivity as listed in this slide. So one is variability in temperature, mostly increasing temperatures, fluctuating precipitation patterns, emergence of crop pests and diseases, as well as elevated surface carbon dioxide emissions. The impact of these factors, especially the interaction among each other will be different for different regions of the world and for different crops. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we're just looking at one modeling study that looked at one factor, increasing temperatures. And it showed that a one degree C increase in temperature could reduce the global yields of rice, maize, and wheat from three to 7%. Next slide, please. And so today we brought together experts working on different uh, cereal crops to share their thinking on what they see as the greatest challenges and op scientific opportunities to address them. The first three speakers will offer their insights on solving current problems while preparing crops for future environments and to make sure that innovations are delivered to smallholder farmers. Our last two speakers will talk about approaches to scale up and disseminate improved crop varieties. Last slide, please. So we invite you to submit questions uh, for the speakers and uh, as well as to add your ideas on challenges we need to address and scientific opportunities that we should consider. Thank you so much. Over to Alison. Many thanks, Nora, for introducing this topic and for the opportunity to tell you more about uh, the work we're doing in the CIMIT Global Wheat Program uh, to safeguard future uh, wheat. Uh, and here today, I'm gonna to talk about our work on balancing production, resilience, and sustainability. Next slide, please. The key takeaways from my presentation today and from the work that we do here at CIMIT, uh, based in Mexico with a global program, uh, is that wheat is pivotal to alleviation of hunger. Uh, as Nora uh, has expressed in her presentation, we see many challenges associated with climate change uh, and the provision of this key staple uh, food crop, uh, which is eaten by 2.5 billion people around the world. We also know that over 50% of the world's wheat is grown in the global south by predominantly smallholder farmers. Uh, and we know here we can see disproportionate impacts of climate change on production. So, so this is really key to, to understanding how we mitigate uh, and adapt our crops uh, to future uncertainty. We really aim to build resilience whilst maintaining productivity because as Nora has expressed, the, the production of food still remains a, a key uh, and pivotal part of our strategy to, to feed the growing population. Uh, so we're really building resilience within this framework of maintaining our future, uh, our current and future productivity uh, to underpin food security. In our wheat research and breeding, we're looking at accelerating improvements. So accumulating the technologies and, and tools that are available to us as plant breeders uh, and also to, to work on how we integrate these with system components in order to achieve impact at scale. Uh, and I'll give some examples of that in my presentation. Uh, and finally, we require approaches to rapidly and equitably accumulate and deploy science innovation. 
as Nora described, science and, and research has really been the driver of agricultural uh, productivity increases. Uh, and the challenge is to, to really make sure those, those innovations are, are equitably available uh, to farmers and specifically to smallholder farmers in the Global South. Next slide, please. So if we look at wheat and its role in alleviation of hunger, uh, and very much focused on, on this figure of the expectation of, of huge numbers of people in extreme poverty by 2030, we can see wheat uh, as a component of human diets is a, is a hugely important source of daily, uh, daily energy. So in this map, you can see uh, the ranking of, of daily calorie uh, sources from plants with sugar excluded. Uh, and we can see here that wheat uh, shown in red uh, is is the number one uh, the number one uh, source of calories uh, in many diets uh, around the world and, and in many diverse production regions uh, of the world. Next slide, please. In addition to the in addition to the provision of of energy, uh, wheat is also uh, a crucial source of of protein in human diets, uh, and we can also see that uh, in our mapping. Uh, and as, as Nora shared, uh, global wheat production is forecast to, to reduce by 6% uh, with the impacts of climate change, and that's been shown in several studies. But we can also look at the patterns of these climate change uh, predicted impacts. Uh, and what we see is that these are really unequal. So in this map here, you can see the, the expected um, changes in yield over time using 2050 climate modeling data. Uh, and here we see in blue, there's some expectations, particularly in the global north, of increasing uh, productivity in, in wheat due to the, the creation of favorable climatic conditions. But we really see most of the reds, the, the oranges and the yellows, so the, the negative uh, and significantly negative impacts of climate change on yield uh, will mostly be felt uh, in the global south. Uh, and we can see, particularly in some regions such as South Asia, really marked uh, impacts on predicted yields as a result of climate change. So we, we can see that through the patterns of our predicted changes in climate and the impacts of those on productivity, a large proportion of our predicted yield decreases will occur and impact smallholder farmers in the global south. Uh, and these projections also help us to really focus our efforts on, on climate adaptation uh, as well as mitigation strategies. So they highlight regions where we can see that the climate impacts are forecast to be greatest. Uh, and, and this allows us to target our interventions to the short, medium and long term. Uh, and in addition to this, we can, we can uh, overlay the other cereals uh, which will be discussed today uh, and really identify the hotspots where we know we'll see multiple impacts on, on multiple staple cereal crops uh, due to climate change impacts. Next slide, please. So within the CIMIT program, as I mentioned, we're looking at building resilience in this framework of the necessity to maintain our current levels of productivity and increase productivity uh, to keep pace with demand. Uh, and this recent analysis of our global wheat trialing network data uh, collected over, over many years, you can see starting at 1988 uh, here in the graph, uh, has been looking at the yield stability question. So can we not only increase yield, but can we increase the stability or the resilience of yield in, in changing climates? Uh, and here we've used the power of historical data uh, to really look at changing climate climatic trends over time and understanding how resilient or stable the yields of our material, uh, our germplasm are. Uh, and what this graph here shows is that uh, yield stability has been reduced over time, which is indicated by this increasing frequency of crossovers, so the changes of rankings of performance of different material. Uh, and this really tells us that we can expect climate uh, instability to reduce the stability of the yield that we can reliably deliver. However, interestingly, on the right hand side of this graph, we can see that in our stress and heat adapted breeding pipelines, where we're breeding materials specifically for high stress conditions, uh, we see this effect much less markedly. Uh, and this gives us an indication that breeding specifically uh, to target these stress conditions, whether they be uh, reduced water, high temperature, uh, increasing uh, 
increasing multiple stress uh, events gives the, provides the potential to, to enhance the yield stability uh, through the breeding process. Next slide, please. Within the CIMIC Global Wheat Programme, we're really working to accelerate the improvement of germplasm for global distribution. Uh, and our program aims to deliver improved wheat germplasm to, uh, to breeding programs, national programs uh, in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, and we do this through a wide adaptation strategy and through the provision of material that's, uh, that accumulates a, a number of trait uh, components, agronomic performance, disease packages, and this resilience element, the ability to, to respond uh, and maintain productivity in stress conditions. Uh, and at the moment, we have two core elements of our, of our effort to accelerate improvement. Uh, the first of these, which is shown in the images in the top, is accelerating the population improvement and trait introgression process in our four breeding pipelines. So here we're using speed breeding on the left, uh, as well as a, a large scale uh, rapid generation advance uh, facility to, to really focus our efforts on the early stages of the breeding program process. So can we really speed up these early generations, get material at a much earlier stage uh, to partners around the world uh, and allow for more of the selection to happen in the production environments where we know these stresses are able to uh, select uh, material uh, that are really optimized for those production environments. So here we're using a lot of genomic technology as well as this this pure uh, focus on speed through, through the use of speed breeding and, and adaptive controlled conditions uh, to really drive forward these early stages of the breeding program and also to bring in new trait diversity uh, and to make it as available as quickly as possible uh, to partners around the world. In the bottom images, we can, you can also see our, our work uh, as part of the Heat and Drought Wheat Improvement Consortium on pre-breeding and trait discovery for climate specific adaptation traits. Uh, so here we're really going upstream of the breeding process and saying what are the traits that, that growers will, will need to have access to uh, in 5, 10, 20 years time. So here we take uh, wild relatives, uh, and novel diversity, look at things like the photosynthetic mechanisms and how these can be supercharged uh, and used as a tool uh, in our breeding program. Uh, and really what we're trying to do is to do this at scale. Uh, to understand how we can not only accelerate the, the early stages of the breeding process, but also of the upstream discovery and integration of that into our breeding program. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned in my takeaway slide, one of the challenges and one of the big opportunities is to put this genetic innovation into our systems. Uh, and we know that the farming system uh, dictates uh, much of what's manifest in our, in our varieties that we produce through the breeding process. Uh, and this is an example of some work uh, here at CIMIT on, on how we can mitigate uh, heat uh, and heat stress specifically through crop management. Uh, we do a lot of work on, on conservation agriculture and also on the use of drip irrigation uh, to, in irrigated um, cereal production systems. Uh, and really how that can help to buffer yield across temperatures. And in this graph, you can see where we use drip irrigation uh, versus the conventional flooding irrigation that, that's used in Sonora uh, in Northern Mexico, we can really see this allows us to stabilize our yield across uh, a gradient of temperatures. So we know that, that using these, uh, these management interventions, we can mitigate some of the impacts of, of temperature. Uh, and then we also have this component of our varieties uh, and, and the ability to identify varieties which are uh, more resilient as well. So really a lot of opportunity to combine these two together. Next slide, please. And this is an example of where we have actually been able to optimize the combination of varieties into the cropping system uh, and coordinating it with the use of on-farm mechanization. Uh, and as part of the cereal seeds, uh, the cereal systems uh, for South Asia, projects. Uh, we've been addressing uh, some of the environmental uh, issues of stubble burning, uh, which obviously has a, a large impact on both uh, the environment uh, as well as human health. Uh, and here we were really able to optimize varieties, so to develop varieties specifically uh, to fit in a system that could be 
uh, use uh, the mechanization advances in terms of residue management and, and different planting dates. So really a huge amount of power when we can, can combine our genetic innovations through varieties uh, into cropping systems uh, and, and value added mechanization. So we can deliver a, a complete package uh, that allows us to, to mitigate uh, and adapt to some of these challenges. Next slide, please. So really, to, to finalize uh, my presentation, uh, as I mentioned before, we have uh, the, the challenge to equitably accumulate and deploy our innovations. Uh, and in our case, we have a centralized program aiming to deliver a value-added germplasm uh, globally uh, and also to integrate this into systems. Uh, and to, in order to integrate it into systems, we've adopted a, a hub model, which is shown in this graphic. Uh, graphic on the, on the left hand side uh, and this really says can we put our varieties into systems into the hands of farmers generate data and collect it uh, and then use that feedback to, to further refine the process uh, and in Mexico this hub model has has been very successful you can see the black dots where we have a specific hub and we're really trying to disseminate this this information and the innovation outwards, uh, as you can see in the, the red dots, to, to multiple farmers. So to use these hubs as platforms uh, to allow us to disseminate uh, these innovation packages uh, to farmers throughout specific uh, target regions. Next slide, please. So just to, to, to wrap up, many thanks for the opportunity to present. Uh, in the Simic Global Wheat Program, we're aiming to, to develop staple crops with enhanced nutritional benefits, uh, resilience to climate change, uh, and market readiness to understand how they can better serve smallholder farmers in the Global South. Thank you very much, and I'll hand over to Charlie Messina for the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Thanks, uh, Nora, for the opportunity to share some thoughts. Uh, we'll provide some perspectives on breeding for climate change. Uh, next, please. The key uh, takeaways that I would like you to remember is that the framework for breeding for climate change is lacking. Uh, there's a number of words here for you to relate later, but remember that. I think we, we need uh, a framework to have informed discussions and Alison cover many activities around that will be components of that framework. The other thing is we need to remember uh, there will be many journeys to adapt to climate change and what I mean with the journeys we don't need to think about the idiotype of that sort of a, a adapted corn to 2100 but we need to produce hybrids on 2030, 40, and so on. Uh, we have bringing technologies to uh, make uh, a reality and adapt to climate change. We need to be proactive to implement this and bring that framework to, to life. And I think success is, is possible if we agree on, on such a framework and activate some of the bringing technologies that we're proving to drive adaptation. Next, please. Let me unpack a little bit about the why I, I said that we need or a framework is lacking. Uh, Nora presented some results that are pretty much similar to the map of Europe in there. Alison alluded before to some of the publications. And when you start reviewing at least the major literature on climate change and breeding, you can see the scientists or the scientific community is searching for this framework and just looking at different perspectives. So the, the bub of Europe here is looking at climate change from that environmental perspective. Is it drought? Is it heat stress? Is it flooding? Well, what is the challenge that climate change is going to bring and what do we need to breed for? Some other uh, publications, they will look at what are the traits that are needed to adapt to climate change and what is the management some others are looking at the operation aspects of it, whether we need to start adapting the seed production systems in order to deliver the product in a timely manner. And finally, and this is most recent, and I, I'm glad Alison showed the, a little bit of the details of this study from the, the colleagues in, in, in CIMIT with Matthew Reynolds and, uh, and others, it's showing this crossover interactions and in addition to uh, uh, the instability angle that Alison alluded to, 
I think it's, this is critical having this quantitative perspective. But going back to the lack of a framework, you can see that the community is surfacing many different aspects of the framework, but it's not a framework that brought all, the, all of them together. The so next slide, please. So going back to the genotype by environment interaction, one of the key problems, in addition to the instability, is that when you have crossover interactions, so sort of that uh, uh, figure in the middle, what it, it generates a massive problem for breeders to create and deliver the product. So here on the right, you see this uh, rubber sheet that I think it will illustrate a little bit of the, the problem and why we need a framework to, to have this pop discussion. So think about the vertical axis is how the uh, hybrids will perform if we breed for a certain target population of environment, say the future climates or current climate, if we select in environments that will resemble those or not. So these peaks, you look at the diagonal, and you see that the, the peaks think about we are breeding for climate change, 2050 for, for picking an example, and how the hybrids will perform in 2050 environments. And you can see they will do really well. Uh, just for visualizations and make a lower peak on the other, uh, on the that diagonal. Or if we select for hybrids in 2020, they will perform really well in 2020. When you have crossover interactions, look at these two uh, lower points on the other corners of that cube. And you can see that if we select for 2020 environment and look at the performance in 2050, what you're going to get is the map that uh, both Alison and Nora show saying that you are going to have 7% 7, 7 reduction or more in yield. So we need to start breeding for climate change to prevent those reductions and negative impacts of the climate. But if we, on the other corner, if we start breeding for climate change today because of the crossover interaction, it's going to have a negative impact on the hybrids of 2020 and 2030. So what this is telling us is, this is a Goldilocks problem. We can start breeding too aggressively for climate change because it can impact the, the, uh, uh, the productivity of the hybrids in the near future, but we can sort of delay that, prob uh, that breeding effort too long in the future or we're going to have these negative impacts that have been anticipated. So each, and to make it worse, as Nora said, these are journeys and each community is going to have one rubber sheet like this that we have to think about what is the best strategy in terms of time and intensity and breeding technologies that are going to navigate that journey from today to 2050, 2100, delivering products every year without getting too ahead of a game or lagging too uh, much behind. Next, please. So we need a framework. So what are the core objectives of the framework? And here, the first thing it come to mind to me is we need to stop the bleeding first. Uh, we need to start stopping the problem of the externalities and greenhouse gas emissions. The second is we need to regenerate in aquifers and soils and agriculture by the biodiversity. And at the same time, we need to deliver these products today and into the future. So what sort of framework uh, can uh, help us or is in place or start shaping uh, and today. Next, please. And that is the, the framework of circularity in agriculture proposed by MacArthur Foundation. And we can analyze circularity from the highest level, like this cartoon here, where it shows agriculture having an, uh, an effect on climate change. Climate change affects negatively agriculture and Human health, human health affect negatively agriculture. So this thing will spiral down to disaster if we don't intervene. And we can do a similar analysis all the way to the cropping system of even the plant and look at the circularity at many different details. So at this high level of detail of circularity, what things, or what are the connections that can help us break these uh, feedback loops that can lead us to disaster? Next, please. And what I think it is, is the diets. Diets essentially dictate or translate what uh, society is telling agriculture what to produce. If we uh, tell uh, agriculture, uh, our farmers, that we want to eat uh, a lot of steaks, 
uh, they're going to produce corn, a lot of corn, to satisfy that demand. If, in contrast, we uh, tell agriculture we want more protein-based uh, 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 vegetable proteins, they're going to shift that pattern. So diets is at the core that connects this human health and demands with agriculture. And of course, the human diets are the core of preventing stunting and, and, and non-reportable diseases. So what's the role of plant breeding in all this uh, framework? And next, please. The plant breeder, what essentially is going to do is going to translate these societal demands into genetic solutions to enable the transformation of agriculture. And um, once we, we have some profiles of the diets, plant breeding knows how to deliver those and enable agriculture to uh, transform itself. So next, please. So with that context, how are you going to transition from uh, the current agriculture or modern agriculture into this more circular one? And I think the, the answer um, is, is pretty much built upon what we know how to do and we know is successful, which is uh, uh, using the breeding technologies of today. I think uh, the first thing we need to do is ensure that everywhere that we are going to target, and if it's a Saharan uh, Africa, we need to have precision phenotyping. We need to collect good data. We need to have uh, good practice and, and uh, be a good stewards of those plots. Uh, without that, we are not going to make any progress. So we, it may even in some places go back to the basics. The second bit that we can harness is many stress environments that was a fundamental to deliver drought tolerant maize in Corteva. Uh, in these many stress environments, we can mimic or we can manage the stresses in order to surface adaptive traits to different environmental conditions. And there's a, a vast literature there from Corteva examples to some of the CIMIT work done uh, in maize uh, for sure. And the other thing is we need to have this wide area testing, so make sure the products perform the way as intended, and that was also critical in the development of the Aquamax products, uh, whereby the agronomists work with the breeders and with the farmers to optimize what are the genetic by the management combinations that lead the most or um, um, leave the most value to, to the grower and let those varieties exp express their potential. And finally, I think in, in, in the current world with artificial intelligence, and this is just one example I put there, combining crop models for whole genome prediction, is surfacing as a way and a method that is going to accelerate the rate of genetic gain by increasing the predictive skill of uh, um, of our methods to inform selection decisions. And also this uh, crop growth model whole genome prediction, what it's going to do is will enable us to do something quite particular, which is extending this framework that is, if you will, one dimensional productivity and the drought stress in multiple dimensions. Next, please. So this is this uh, framework works. And I uh, just want to show you a little bit of the uh, results that uh, we are uh, finally getting uh, to together after two decades of breeding for drought tolerance. And here we use uh, this framework of a gap analysis whereby in the x-axis, the y-axis, you have grain yield and the x-axis, uh, water use. That lead us to not think about drought, but what is the productivity for any given level of evapotranspiration. So you can map your geography into the x-axis here. The difference between these black dots and uh, the, the black lines, which it tells you what is the yield gap and what we can do with breeding to close that gap and make it more production. Essentially, how we are going to realize that environmental potential. And what you can see in the box plot essentially is that the yield gap, the lower is the, the better, right? It closed that gap. In the generation, the second generation of Aquamax products, the gap is smaller than the first generation and is smaller than the uh, non-drought tolerant material. So essentially it's telling you that we can uh, transverse or live through these uh, journeys and by applying systematically some of these breeding technologies, we can deliver progress uh, over time. Next, please. And let me get back to the need for this multidimensional framework. So 
And the breathing framework I described very much was one dimension. I was just looking at the, the, the crop and whether it's the disease packages or the productivity and the drought and the stability. But in the context of circularity and the objectives of this framework I'm suggesting we need to have in place, it's multidimensional. We need to start looking not only at the productivity, but also what is happening with that nitrogen use efficiency, with the, nit the water use efficiency and carbon. So we need to start looking at multiple dimensions. Some of the problems we have here is some of the metrics that we need to use for selections are incompatible with the time scales of the breeding decisions. And here is where I alluded before to use some of the crop models that we can generate that data and assess the implications of different selection decisions in the long term, but can inform us what are the opportunities to produce more productive crops with a lower impact on the externalities and help us think about how you re regenerate uh, some of the uh, natural resources. So go back to, if we go, uh, um, get to the final slide, if, um, uh, please. Um, so here we'd like to uh, conclude with this uh, example, uh, pretty simple, going back to the uh, framework of yield and evapotranspiration, whereby the breather now, using these uh, predictions for different genotypes, can make informed decisions in fruit production, the evapotranspiration or water availability, the opportunity to do carbon sequestration, and what is the efficiencies looking at the slopes of those functions uh, for different different geographies, depending on uh, 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 the, the geography the breeder is working, let's say less than 400 millimeters of upper transpiration, you can see genotypes one over the 30 years that we might think about the, the future uh, climate is preferred to genotype B. If there's a, a lot of water, even irrigation, Genotype B is, is preferred over genotype A when more than 400 millimeters. Now, if we think about the carbon sequestration and the 400 millimeters come at the expense of using irrigation, perhaps that's not a very smart proposition using water from uh, aquifers to sequester carbon, but maybe we need to go back and just do the production of yield. So in any case, each of the journeys and each of the geographies is going to have a case that we can map into these small frameworks. And the way we did it for water in here, we can do it for nitrogen and other resources in order, in order to enable the breeders to make these selections in multiple dimensions. So what I would like to conclude, and I would like to leave this uh, framework or an example of what is the possible is the framework for breathing climate change is lacking. I show you that the technology and the theoretical framework um, and theory is available for us to create such a framework, and each of a journey will require applying this framework in different manners. And uh, with that, I think I would like to thank you again and pass on to Jeff. Hey, thanks, Charlie. Um, next slide, please. So I want to make two main points today. One is that NARS-led breeding networks are essential for success in sorghum and millet. And two, that complex traits require simple approaches. Next slide, please. So as many of you may know, uh, ICRASAT has moved out of the CG. And so this has really led to a lot of thinking and discussion now on what are the best roles for NARS CG uh, innovation labs that would best serve smallholders uh, in the sorghum and millet space. Next slide. And I've been thinking a lot about this kind of from first principles now that we have an opportunity for kind of a new start uh, in this community. And for me, the first principle is that our stakeholders are very diverse. Their knowledge on their needs and their wants, the, the demand, is highly localized and diffused. Next. Um, so this, the, the farmers, the consumers, the processors are very diverse across the sorghum and millet growing regions. Next slide, please. 
And because of this, NARS, the national programs are in the best position to understand and aggregate knowledge on local demand and to develop and deliver varieties based on this knowledge. Next. Um, so they, the NARS have the connection to the local demand that's essential, and they have specialized re research expertise to develop the varieties based on this local demand. Here, designating, uh, for instance, different countries in West Africa with these uh, different colors. Next slide, please. The CG is in the best position in sorghum and mills to provide foundational R&D support at scale. Uh, across the crops, across geographies. And um, one thing to point out that, um, that I'm arguing, uh, I think it's important that, C that the CG now, when they look at the sorghum and millet space, make the decision not to have breeding programs responsible for varietal development. The reason is that that necessarily really puts the CG in competition with the NARS that they're meant to serve. They have huge amounts of technical uh, and specialized research expertise uh, to offer their NARS partners, and I hope they can focus um, on that and let the NARS uh, lead the breeding. Next slide, please. What about the innovation labs? I think the innovation labs uh, are in the best position to provide uh, some of the most specialized research expertise due to their connection with research universities around the world and um, to leverage more targeted project funding. Um, dealing, uh, helping the system deal with, say, new and emerging pests or the most uh, highly specialized research on recalcitrant um, traits or new methodology. Next slide, please. So this is the vision that um, I hope we can uh, bring about for the sorghum and millet space. Uh, the NARS have been preparing to lead. They've been uh, trained uh, by multiple projects, by CG, um, by USAID to lead. And these NARS breeding networks, they exist today in sorghum and millet, and they're ready to uh, lead varietal development. Next slide, please. The second um, point that I would like to argue is that Complex traits require simple approaches. Next slide. It's helpful to think about the history of NARS breeding over the last few decades. Most of that's really been done um, using forward breeding in relatively small populations when you look at the history of sorghum and millet breeding. Um, and so typically there'd be a locally preferred variety um, that was adapted agronomically, agroclimatically in many ways, but would have some defects. In this case, uh, on, the, um, on the left side, I'm showing um, a variety with strigus susceptibility, and um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm diagramming basically a, a schematic chromosome with different uh, loci, right? And on the right side, the breeders might cross this with a, um, with a donor variety that has the resistance they're looking for, but unfortunately is maladapted in a number of other ways. Uh, next slide, please. And what this has often led to is a real struggle to get the, say, the resistance they're looking for because the populations are so small, and also really hard to recover all the original adaptation that they're looking for. In a lot of cases, that's led to quite limited adoption compared to what was hoped for. Next slide. So in a lot of ways, um, the breeding's been stymied by the complexity of adaptation um, to local conditions, local preferences. And now we're adding on this issue of climate change. We're not adding on, the, the world is, is putting this in our, on our plate, right? Um, and so the question arises, does NARS need, um, does NARS breeding for complex traits like climate adaptation need cli uh, complex approaches um, of the type um, that, that Charlie was just describing? Um, and, and we, in some ways, are working on all of these things, but I actually want to make um, kind of the opposite argument. Um, next slide, please. I really think the complex traits, in, in this case, require simple approaches. And it's helpful to think about why did these leading seed companies develop and adopt these complex approaches. And 
it's easy to get lost in the technology. Um, that's a pitfall that you know we've um, we've dealt with on on our own projects. But I think at the uh, at the heart, the essence is that all these technologies facilitate many small but decisive experiments. Uh, I think the wrong lesson in this case to learn is that we should just transfer the suite of um, complex technologies that the leading seed companies use, but, and the, but the right lesson would be to understand and use and learn from the discipline problem, problem solving approach that the, the companies applied in developing uh, these approaches. Importantly, the problems that the NARS are facing today are not the same problems um, in, in the really nuts and bolts of the breeding program that the, um, the leading seed companies were facing when they were developing um, these technologies. Yes, they're related, but um, local context really matters. Next slide, please. So what type of technologies could facilitate these many small decisive experiments uh, for NARS? I think first and foremost is the scientific method. The scientific method, um, starting you know several hundred years ago, got our human society from zero to where we are today. It's the most powerful technology we have. The focus on excluding hypotheses as quickly and efficiently as possible, not collecting as much data or using whatever the new tools are. Going back to uh, the foundational breeding fundamentals, uh, these facilitate every experiment, and we've been focusing a lot on these. Something like classical genetics. So my, my job description is quantitative trait genomics, uh, but more and more, every day I realize the classical genetics foundations are way more powerful, way more efficient at answering some of these questions than the newest um, tools that, um, that we have. And yes, we want to use or adapt um, new technology, but only when it's necessary and only, um, only guided by uh, rigorous and efficient hypothesis. Next slide, please. And just to give a little example of how um, our thinking has been changing and what we've been focusing based on these ideas, um, I give an example of the problems of recovering uh, local adaptation um, and so because of that, we have been refocusing on approach of using introgression lines. This is an approach that was working in sorghum all the way back to the 40s to get really decisive experiments because you're not disrupting the whole genome. Uh, you have much more powerful uh, than on-station screening or on-farm trials when you're just um, changing one part of the genome. Uh, you get new varieties that then are uh, largely acceptable and appreciated uh, by the stakeholders, and you can iterate much more quickly. So in conclusion, um, how, um, how am I suggesting we should adapt uh, sorghum and millets for climate change from now to 2050? We should really focus on helping these NARS breeding networks, developing varieties that will be adopted in 2025 and 2028, um, help them start these these rapid uh, but decisive uh, iterations. And uh, with that, um, I'll uh, pass it on. Oh, sorry, uh, next slide, just the acknowledgments. Uh, wanting to thank um, my NARS breeder and researcher collaborators on the USAID and uh, Gates Foundation projects where we've been developing uh, these approaches. And uh, with that, I'll pass it on to uh, uh, Tony uh, Gathungu from Syngenta. Thank you, Jeff, and um, uh, hi, everyone, and uh, glad to be here. So I'm going to be talking about um, scaling of climate smart technologies, uh, essentially looking through uh, the lens of a product life cycle, um, which essentially is uh, the best practice in terms of uh, bringing uh, technologies to the hands of small-scale farmers. Next slide. So what do we do? Uh, for those who are not familiar with the uh, Syngenta Foundation, so we are a not-for-profit foundation based out of Basel in Switzerland. Uh, and our vision is a brighter future for smaller farming. And uh, we do have uh, areas of work, or what we call streams of work, um, which one, one of them being agri-services, which is where we build 
uh, agri agripreneurs or entrepreneurs in the ag space um, through supporting uh, aggregation of small-scale farmers, where farmers are able to get access for uh, access to inputs, access to um, uh, advisory services, access to mechanization, soil health, among others. And we also look at um, um, how to help farmers de-risk uh, their investments in the farms uh, through affordable insurance uh, products. And uh, we also have Seeds, which is where I sit, uh, which is called Seeds to Be or Seeds to Business, where we catalyze access of seed of improved varieties uh, for the crops that farmers need. And we do have two other streams that support our, our work. Uh, one is research and development, helping us scout uh, really the globe um, to find uh, great technologies that we can then be able to transfer over to the hands of small scale farmers. And we wouldn't be able to do that without uh, an enabling policy environment. So, of course, we have a team that uh, supports that work across uh, all the countries of focus. Next slide. So, what are some of the elements of our work on climate change? So, um, CSRA or Climate Smart uh, Resilient Agriculture is embedded in our, uh, our, our, our strategy. Uh, we just renewed our strategy uh, a couple of months ago in 2021. And um, Strengthening, strengthening our ambition to support smallholder farmers uh, to better deal with, uh, you know, this issue that we are all facing, which is climate change. And um, SFSA, uh, or rather, we work on a variety of initiatives across all our streams um, to be able to support all these elements um, uh, that I just talked about. So we're working on breeding and commercialization of uh, uh, climate smart genetics, whether it's on maize, uh, potato, teff, uh, among other crops. Uh, we also work on index-based insurance solutions, as I mentioned, to support small older farmers. Um, also looking at uh, testing and commercializing uh, soil amendments. Also looking at um, adaptation and distribution of low-cost uh, water-efficient irrigation, uh, as well as looking at uh, energy-efficient uh, mechanization uh, elements, all supporting um, CSRA, as I mentioned. And on uh, the seeds to be uh, stream, which is where it sits. Uh, delivering and scaling of these uh, climate smart technologies is really at the core of what we do um, through this model of variety commercialization that I'll talk about. And of course, we don't do that in isolation. So we, we do bring partners uh, along the way and we do um, uh, like working with uh, partners, um, you know, within our ag space. And, our, you know, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, because that's really important to bring these uh, technologies to small scale farmers. Next slide. So I talked about the product life cycle, um, which is uh, displayed uh, on the slide here. And really it's, it's, it's the journey that a variety takes from inception all the way to the time it actually exits the market. And this is what we use as a best practice and as a guide to um, uh, you know, have this systematic approach to guiding varieties from um, breeding all the way to commercialization. There is a gap between breeding and commercialization, which is really where we want to ensure that um, uh, varieties that are coming in from the breeding pipeline really are fit for purpose. They're really um, what farmers need or the market needs. And what we do is assessing um, uh, all those requirements, whether it's um, uh, we need to assess whether the, the, the products are climate smart or the technology is climate smart. We need to assess whether um, their need, of course, they, 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 they have an agroecological fit um, into the areas of where the farmers are, or meeting uh, demands for processors, meeting demands for food for small scale farmers. So what you see in gray uh, is really uh, in broad what we do, and I'll touch on that in the next slide. Uh, problem definition, we define the problem, we design that solution of where, what we need to solve for. And of course, the solution delivery is really this other area where from stage five onwards, where we're testing the varieties, we're registering the varieties, we're supporting uh, early generation seed production, um, certified seed production, licensing approaches, among others. So really a, a good guide to how to, 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 to systematically bring varieties to the market. Next slide. So when you take a deep dive into this, really this is what we follow. Um, and without going into too much detail, just to bring your attention to the areas highlighted in yellow, as you can see from a problem definition perspective, we do identify the farmer needs. 
um, we look at the crops, we look at the countries of forecast. What are what are what what what's the climate like? What's the agroecology look like? What are the farmers' challenges? What does the value chain uh, look like? Is it mature? Is it just starting? Um, then we we then start looking at how to design the solutions that uh, we've identified, you know, in terms of the problems, um, and start looking at the farmer segments that we need to target. Uh, we also look at uh, a very systematic target product profile. Um, so, of course, we look at the best varieties in the market and, of course, the varieties that are coming in through the pipeline, making sure that they meet those profiles of what we're looking at and, of course, what the segment uh, requires um, from a perspective of uh, bringing those varieties. We also look at um, uh, the ROI for the smallholder farmer. We may be bringing a value chain that the farmer may not be able to invest in, so we want to make sure that there is an investment back or a, 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 a return back to the small-scale farmers or the investment, um, the, the investees, whether it's, it's an SME seed company uh, or a processor uh, or a farmer. We also look at uh, business models. We do stakeholder mapping. Who are we going to bring along? Uh, early generation seed producers, the regulators, all those people have to come to the table. And of course, we also look at the investment case itself. As I mentioned previously, there has to be an investment case so for, the, for the varieties to make it uh, to, to, to the market. And finally, looking at the delivery itself, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. Um, uh, looking at how to launch those varieties, um, looking at the performance, um, uh, you know, making sure farmers are able to access and see them in in in, in demo fields and and, uh, and and so that they can appreciate the varieties' uh, performances. Looking at the distribution pathways, who's going to do what, who's going to do the production of the seed, uh, EGS, and of course also looking at how we support the SMEs to license some of these varieties coming in from the breeding pipeline, uh, whether it's from the public sector or the private sector. Uh, and of course, planning, sales forecasting, making sure that what is required is what we're bringing in through the pipeline so that everybody at least sees uh, a key investment in bringing in these climate smart technologies to, to the market. Next slide. So I wanna talk about um, a case example um, in India. Um, and this is where we've, uh, the foundation um, has catalyzed a private, a public-private partnership approach. Um, so we've worked with CIMIT uh, as well as Syngenta um, to develop drought-tolerant, um, low-cost hybrid maize uh, for low rainfall areas of South Asia. In this case, it's India. Uh, and we've been targeting uh, the West Central India, uh, part of India, which is, which is, uh, which is quite semi-arid. And the partnership integrates um, African drought tolerance traits uh, from CIMIT, uh, germplasm collection, and uh, incorporating those into the elite par parental lines uh, from Syngenta to develop um, a triple, uh, triple cross varieties uh, that can be licensed to small uh, uh, local SMEs. Now, AAA stands for um, affordable, accessible, and Asian uh, varieties that we've been able to then uh, support to bring to the market. And uh, as you can see, uh, the approach was uh, 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 to look at the holistically uh, the environment where the farmers are, uh, what, are they ch what are the challenges, what are the investment cases, and we're then able to develop this drought-tolerant, uh, high-yielding and affordable varieties that we call AAA. And we've been able to reach uh, well over 12,000 farmers so far um, in the last um, uh, Karif season in India. So we're really excited about the opportunity to be able to scale this up going forward and also looking at uh, areas of uh, complementarity that we can scale up also the, the same um, uh, program into, into Africa. Next slide. Another example is um, right where I sit in Kenya, which is in Samburu County, um, an area in Kenya, in Northern Kenya, that's, uh, that's really primarily uh, pastoral. So farmers basically uh, keep livestock uh, as, their, as a key source of livelihood. Uh, and very semi-arid um, and has instances of recurring drought uh, year on year. Uh, but there's areas of that um, agroecology that are arable. So we thought about looking at a partnership approach with International Potato Center, the local NARS, which is Calro, and ourselves to do trials of adapted potato varieties. So we looked at the altitude, the drought tolerance aspect, the disease uh, resistance, uh, uh, dormancy elements. And we did a lot of demonstrations bringing farmers uh, into the mix. As you can imagine, this is a historical pastoral region 
uh, to help them understand that they need to diversify into crops and specifically uh, potato. And the fact that um, those soils have never seen uh, potatoes in, uh, in the past means that they'll be disease free. So we did a lot of work also um, uh, sensitizing them about looking at uh, the apical cutting techno technology as well as uh, to support early generation seed production. So, um, so the solution there was, of course, we've been able to uh, identify varieties uh, through our, our pasta program supported by USAID. We've reached over 2,500 farmers. Uh, and as you can see there, uh, this is an image I took um, in a recent um, uh, harvest festival that we had. And these farmers are just elated at the opportunity to be able to diversify uh, into something that they can actually feed themselves and, of course, support their livelihoods. And, of course, this is something that we want to scale up in, in other areas of Kenya as well. Next slide. So um, just to uh, close, um, my thoughts here are, are that you know, I mean, climate change is, is, let's all agree that it's really one of the most important issues that we all must face today. And um, helping farmers uh, to be able to adapt to these changes. I mean, I talked about the, the case in India, the case in Kenya, uh, to adapt to these changes. And most importantly, uh, to be a part of the solution to to this climate change is really at the core of what we must do. Um, so I, I, it's a challenge to us all, and I think we can do it. So uh, for us at the foundation, we invite uh, like-minded partners, individuals, um, and institutions uh, to, to come together to, to try and tackle these issues. I mean, we're, we're already doing this, but we can only do so much as a foundation. So we really look forward to engaging uh, with our partners to be able to do that. So I'll stop there and uh, hand it over to uh, Mark Edge uh, from Bayer. Thank you. Yes, so thank you. First, I want to just check and make sure I'm being able to be heard. Am I, is it coming through? I guess I'll assume that it is working. Um, so um, it's a real pleasure to be here today and uh, talk with all of you and give some examples of uh, partnerships for Climate Smart Maize in Africa. I'm going to focus specifically on the tail, Taylor Maize project that uh, we've been working on. So if you can go on to the next slide, please. So key takeaways to start out with here is that impact at scale for climate adaptation with Climate Smart Maize in Africa hinges on three things. Partnerships, uh, products to deliver value and reduce risk for farmers, and uh, sustainable holistic seed systems for delivery to the farmer. Um, and this Taylor Mays project is a really good case study to show how long-term effort on this, bringing all of these elements together, can deliver results uh, for smallholder farmers in Africa. So move on to the next slide, please. So first, a little bit about the Taylor Mays project and what our vision and mission was to develop climate smart Taylor Mays hybrids for African farmers. Um, and it, over on the left hand side here, you can see the systems based approach, really thinking about it as a system to increase yield stability and reduce risk. Those are key things that farmers need to have in Africa, anywhere actually in the world to address these climate change challenges. Um, and it's really focused on drought tolerance. Um, so this project actually started out called the WEMA project, the Water Efficient Maze for Africa project. And uh, five years ago, ago it got rebranded as the Taylor Maze project. And I'll get into that a little bit. But it started out with the inception of thinking about bringing together all of these elements, the germplasm, the agronomic practices, the trait packages, um, and talking about a systems-based approach to deal with climate challenges in Africa, focused specifically on drought, um, and then along came insects as well as part of the program. But perhaps the easiest way to look at it is just the photos there. On the left-hand side is a fairly typical cornfield or maize field in Africa. Um, I think a lot of people have the perceptions that it's just a low yield environment and that there's uh, low uh, potential there. Um, but there on the right-hand side, you can see that maize can actually be very productive in uh, Africa. We, commonly get trials that are showing you know eight or more tons per hectare of production so the potential is there the question is how do we unlock it and how do we get more adapted to the environment um, on to the next slide please so a little bit about this public private partnership and the flexibility so it started in 2008 um, and the partners in it are cement uh, aatf bayer and then seven nars 
Um, CIMIT, of course, is bringing in its world uh, leadership and maze breeding, knowing how to operate in, in this environment and having a long history there. AATF is the coordinator, sort of the capacity to access and develop these appropriate agricultural technologies. Um, we at Bayer, we contributed proprietary germplasm uh, plus two traits, biotech traits. The drought tolerant trait, which was commercialized here in the United States in 2013, um, and also then the insect protected traits for um, the BT traits, which have been in the marketplace since uh, 1997. Along with that comes regulatory data packages, all that's needed for bringing, introducing biotechnology. I do want to emphasize that this project is not only about biotechnology, there's a conventional breeding aspect of it as well. So you have to bring together this whole system of the germplasm part of it and the conventional breeding, and then bring in the traits. Um, the other thing that is important to emphasize of bringing in here is also the business acumen and the supply, system, the supply chain system of how do you get it to the market. Um, and I'm, in this presentation, I'm not going to talk a lot about getting it to the market because that's a whole other conversation. The focus is really on the partnerships here. But the NARS are a really vital piece of this as well. So there's seven countries that are involved in this. Those are the countries that are highlighted in green over there on that map of Africa. And of course, this is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and USAID. So a, a lot of uh, partners in this, a, a very complex challenge um, and a long-term commitment to it is really what brings it together and what I want to share with you um, today from our um, conversation. Um, so on to the next slide, please. So. One of the things that's really important in this is to start out with a product concept of what are you trying to achieve when you're going to go into this? Where, and, and this is a, a key thing that I think is a, a important to the success of these partnerships is to have a very clear focus of what it is you're trying to accomplish because you can't solve all of the problems with one project. You have to really focus on what is it we're going to try to do. So we spent a lot of time up front defining the product concept and it's pretty simple. It's white hybrids, singular free weight that are adapted to uh, mid altitude in Africa. We wanted a 25% yield improvement compared to 2008, um, bringing in breeding, uh, adding 15% of that in the, in the drought trade and the insect traits, adding the remainder of that. Um, we wanted general product requirements that have drought tolerance, hit the right maturity, the disease resistance, that whole agronomic practices. So again, the multi uh, um, factor evaluation, um, and then the consumer requirements. We have to bring in the concepts around gender as well on this. It's like, what is it going to be acceptable for, um, you know, it making it's a, it's a staple crop, the main part of everybody's meal. You need to make sure that all of these attributes are being considered in the product concept. So we started with a lot of work at the beginning defining that product concept. Go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to jump right to results that we have. This was about six or seven years into the project that we have conventional hybrids that were introduced and we created a brand for those to be helped communicate and it was called Drought Tago. So this brand Drought Tago means that it's conventional non-GM drought tolerant hybrids that are put into the marketplace. We now have more than 120 hybrids that have actually gone through variety registration across these seven countries. Um, but this is an example of the progress that is made on the conventional testing. So the data there is from um, uh, five seasons in, um, in Kenya. This is actually farmers tested fields, not changing any of their practices. So this isn't a research trial. This is actually farmer um, example uh, data from, from farmers fields. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the national average of 1.7 tons. Um, in here, we have these commercial checks that are in, what's commercial in the marketplace, including hybrids from DeKalb or from, from Bayer and also from Corteva. That their average yield was about 3.2 tons per hectare. And the Drought Tago hybrids, because they're climate adapted and that they, in this farmer's field, were uh, yielding 4.9 tons per hectare. So just from a conventional breeding and getting good quality seed, we see an increase of productivity there at 53%. So this is a testament to that you can make really um, substantial improvements in that and have climate adapted hybrids that are getting into the marketplace. 
Um, now, this is actually in the stage of scaling now, and we're getting it to, this, uh, to the farmers in Africa through um, seed African seed companies that license this technology, and we're working with a uh, foundation seed company called Quali Basic Seeds that is producing the foundation seed and selling it to seed companies. Then they produce the hybrids and sell it to the farmers. So these drought tago hybrids are in the marketplace. Um, and the latest estimates that I saw was over 5,000 tons of seed has actually been delivered to smallholder farmers um, through this drought tago um, program. So on to the next slide. <laughs> In 2018, the focus of the WEMA project became very clear that we need to do the next step of get the biotech into the marketplace. And here in uh, Africa, there's a lot of challenges of getting the biotech approvals. And so the focus became on really about this, getting these approvals and the product commercialization in at least four African countries and really focus on the political will that we need to have in place to be able to do that. So that's when it got rebranded as the Tayla Mays project because Tayla Mays is, is the brand that stands for the um, biotech or the GM uh, maize in Africa. And so there's this stepwise process that you need to go through as you've got to develop this, uh, the dossier and get all of that uh, data put in. Then you have to do advocacy and outreach to many communications. Then, then the testing and approval of the compelling products. And finally, the commercialization and deployment. And across these seven countries in Africa, we're at various stages of this. Um, the GM status in Africa is that currently we only have it approved in South Africa, but we have had a breakthrough in Nigeria where they've approved one uh, BT maize and we'll need to have a variety of registration process. So by 2023, we expect to be have GM maize in Nigeria. In Kenya, we are close, but we need a political decision to be able to actually get the final approval of that. But BT cotton has been approved and is commercial already in Kenya, Malawi, and Nigeria, and BT Kalki is actually commercial in Nigeria. So there's certainly progress being made on the front of GM technology coming into Africa and adding value to these. But again, it's not that the GM is the solving all of the problems, it's really about the system-based approach that we need to put together. Uh, on to the next slide, please. So, to give you some example of what we're seeing from an efficacy of our GM hybrids versus non-GM hybrids, this is uh, data from six locations, 12 confined field trials across five countries. Um, and again, this is comparing the checks versus the non-GM versus the GM. And again, these non-GM hybrids are the ones that I would have showed you in the TACO before that were yielding better than the, the commercial checks generally in the marketplace. So what we're seeing here is a very stark difference is that in these environments in Africa where the insects can come in and really devastate the crop, particularly uh, with the in, in introduction of fall armyworm, there's been a big um, challenge of addressing um, you know, insect resistance in, in maize. And so we're seeing, we saw in these trials a 43% yield increase just because of the GM technology. On to the next slide, please. So, Trying to wrap up quickly here and sort of say, what is it about partnerships that we see through this? Because these, what we see is really important from there is, is that it's going to be through these partnerships of us working with the international development organizations like the 1CGIAR and also working closely with the NARS on this to understand the local strengths of what they have. What is it that brings it and makes it all work really well together in partnerships? Well, first of all, the Taylor may, uh, Taylor Mays partnership works because it's building on our core strengths. These are things that each of the partners knows what they, they are fundamental to what they're doing. We're focused on what we do best. We have this common set of objectives that we set up front. We have focused on those specific outcomes and we have milestones in progress and we hold ourselves accountable to those specific outcomes. And the other part is really the long-term commitments by partners and donors. I mentioned this started in 2008. So these, these challenges are not easy to address. They're multifaceted. They take a, a coordinated effort to approach and everybody bringing what their core competencies to the table to help make it happen. We have lots of opportunities, but many challenges that are remaining. The biotech approvals, we need to get that taken care of. We've got farmer awareness. We, we need to have demand-driven markets to really help this. We've got to get seed companies with the capacity and scaling. So 
we have over um, 35 seed companies that, that QBS is working with now in Africa and AATF is working with them, really focusing on what is it they need to do to improve their quality and they've got the stewardship issues that we have to work with, the quality seed production, and then the geographical expansion. We don't want it to only be in these seven countries in Africa. We believe that all of Africa should be um, a, you know, able to, to uh, in, enjoy the benefits of the improved technology and, and improved productivity on their farms and giving choice to smallholder farmers to really make a difference in their lives. So with that, I will wrap up and thank you and uh, turn it over to the moderator, back to Angela. Hey, thank you so much, Mark, and to thank, big thanks to all of the speakers for these really excellent presentations. And a thank you also to the audience for excellent discussion in the chat and the in the Q and A box. And so I thought at this time we transition to some question and answer. Um, and several of these questions have been addressed in the chat box, but I think we can elevate them to discussion here at the end as well. Um, and so the first question um, that we wanted to pose was um, asked by Sachin Ruski, and this is directed toward Allison. And the question is, what are the effects of speeding up generations by changing the photo periods and temperatures on the plant's transcriptome, proteome, and lipidome with a known connection with heat stress tolerance, and ultimately on the breeding for heat stress tolerance? Does it influence our ability to select? And um, Allison? Yeah, thank, thanks, Angela, and thanks for the question. I think it's it's a great question, both in terms of the, the science and the application. Uh, and I think as, as I wrote in the response in the, the early release of speed breeding protocol, I think this was one of the questions that everyone asked, uh, you know, if you turn on the lights and make the, the plants go as quickly as possible uh, and, and use that as a selection process, do you run the risk of actually um, changing your selection selection and i think for us in the simic global wheat program with a wide adaptation strategy that's obviously something that we need to be uh, very aware of both in terms of just the adaptation per se but also um, the ability to to select for the packages of traits that we know that that farmers require and i think particularly in the context of the simic program we're using these speed Speed breeding methods really in the early stages of the, the early generations of the breeding process because we know that we need to get the material into the field to allow us to apply intensive selection for disease uh, in the early stages. Uh, you know, by, by F4, we need to be selecting for, for disease uh, specifically in the field um, under very high disease pressure. And I think we, we haven't yet seen the evidence that we can do that effectively. Uh, in a controlled a controlled set of conditions. So I think it is really important fundamentally to to take these technologies which are developed and and um, available to the community uh, and to test them in terms of how they can be applied in 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 real life breeding programs where you have really a, a lot of trait complexity. You know you you can use speed breeding to introgress uh, a specific disease resistance if you've got markers and, and you can accurately accurately progress that. Um, but, but really what we're looking for are, are packages of traits. Uh, and then I think that that applies specifically to the, the heat the heat adaptation as well, because you really want to get the segregating material into a heat stress selection uh, environment to, to allow um, for accurate selection of, of, of heat uh, resistance or, or tolerance. So I think there's still a lot to be understood mechanistically uh, about what these new technologies do. I also posted that the new speed ventilation protocol, I think the authors of that work have also shown um, very significant differences in gene expression. So, so clearly, uh, you know, making these modifications um, has an impact on, on what happens in the plant. We need to understand that, obviously, to understand the fundamental biology, uh, but also understand how that would impact uh, on our ability to select uh, and provide these trait packages, which are, are really the core of the, the offer of the germplasm uh, to, to farmers, to breeding programs and farmers. Thanks, Angela. Thank you so much, Allison. And actually, while we have you here on camera, I'll ask one more question um, directed for you. Um, so uh, John Schicitano, uh, noted that research and development is a continuum 
and he asked if CGIAR uh, presenters, yourself, uh, could talk more about the product development and commercialization side, including data on uptake and scaling by African businesses. Sure, and I think we had great examples from the Syngent Foundation as well and, and, and in Mark's presentation just now about how we really connect um, some of these, these innovations into the, into the marketplace. But to talk specifically about what we're doing within the CGIAR, we're just launching the, the one CG uh, and a new portfolio, which includes um, a, a very a, a more specific focus on on seed systems and value chains, which is which is exciting really to to kind of put together the the focus on supply, which has really been the the provision of germplasm, the the acceleration of breeding processes through to the demand side and, and what's driving demand. Uh, and then really how we combine that with with the breeding targets that we that we implement. Uh, and I also shared in the Q and A um, some recent work that colleagues at Simit have been doing in the maize space about really trying to understand the drivers of demand, both in terms of what you would buy at an agro dealer, in terms of what seed, uh, and, and what mechanisms or marketing strategies um, drive that kind of demand but also in the, at the farm and in the household level as well. So understanding some of the, the gender components of, of plot management, of decision-making, of, of those choices and preferences on, on how to buy seed and why and when to replace it. Uh, and we're really looking to, even in the wheat space where we have a, obviously a, a great, a, inform, a much greater informal seed sector, looking at really what are the preferences, what are the drivers of demand and trying to marry that together with the, the targeting of the breeding. So I think the commercialization side um, and, and the value chain, uh, we've had some great examples of from Syngenta Foundation and, and Bayer is taking specific products, uh, but from the CG port perspective, really looking to, to, to marry together our supply focus with understanding drivers of demand uh, and, and kind of provide a bridge into that commercialization pathway. Thanks, Angela. Thank you, Allison. Um, and we have a question. Our next question I'll direct for Charlie. Um, Mira Mihilovic asked um, about diets. And so you were discussing diets in your presentation. Um, she notes that they're very difficult to navigate and asks if the diet um, reflects primarily human health or should environment be the primary driver? Charlie? I think they are not mutually exclusive. I, I think if you start transitioning from uh, animal proteins to uh, vegetable proteins, you can have an improved in the diets of humans and you have a positive impact on the environment. So I think the the opportunities uh, are plenty. Um, I don't know if I that, that's uh, the answer you're looking for, but I don't think it's uh, one or the other. I think you need to look at uh, both. Thank you, Charlie. Um, and so the next question I'll ask is uh, directed to Jeff. Uh, so Jeff, um, Hans Joachim uh, Braun asked about um, your confidence in, in the fact that most or all NARS have the capacity to lead variety development. Um, he notes that yield trials have shown 30 to 50 percent um, no significant differences. Um, so he questions if there's a need for massive buildup of NARS capacity. Many of them have don't have the necessary equipment, et cetera. So can you speak to that, Jeff? Um, yeah. So I guess a couple of things um, to point out. Um, the context I was making those comments was in the sorghum and millet space, and um, there may be some important differences uh, between the sorghum and millet space and uh, the wheat uh, world I think um, he's working in. Um, and I guess the question, I mean, my, my honest answer to that is, am I confident that this will work, um, you know, no. I mean, I've been working on this really, uh, really hard with uh, these NARS breeding networks for about uh, eight years, um, and it's really hard. Um, my French colleagues in West Africa have been uh, doing a lot of this work. The NARS themselves have been working really hard on this, and it, and it remains hard. My question and response would be, what option do we have? Uh, the history of sorghum and millet breeding 
it's been tried to have um, the CG leading, and um, and it's and it's underperformed what the people involved really were hoping for. Um, I'm I'm I. What really what I'm arguing is not that I'm confident or that it's easy, but it's the best way forward. I also believe that to the extent that um, NARS capacity is lacking, it hasn't helped to have the CG competing for resources um, with the NARS that they're, uh, that they're you know, um, in, in one hand trying to serve, but on the other hand, uh, competing with. So that's um, that's the rationale. There's lots of needs still, but I really do believe that they're on, they are on on track to lead, and that's our best shot. So, so Jeff, if I could pose a um, a related question that came up in the chat, um, Nazimi Akigos asked um, that um, you know in the developing countries, there's a need for systems that'll combine the powers of universities and the public and private sectors. Oh, yeah. Um, for the development of new varieties. Can you speak to that? Yeah, yeah, I saw that question. That's um, a really great question. Um, and I mean, that's exactly the type of idea that that's why I want, you know, the, the NARS that I work with to, to be in the lead. They're in, you know, we do a little bit of work with um, universities, but I know our NARS partners do a lot more work with their local collaborators and it's so valuable. Um, there's lots of interactions between them and um, the NARS, um, the NARS know who um, their, their collaborators or local collaborators um, can be and should be. Um, and so that is a part of these NARS networks. It's not just um, the NARS themselves, but it's their, their local and regional uh, university uh, collaborators. I think that would be a great area for um, the innovation labs to um, support more in the future in a in a kind of intentional way as well. Okay, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, and on to a question for Tony. Um, and the question is, what is your approach for identifying promising technologies to scale and commercialize? Um, what is Seed to Be's approach to commercializing OPVs? Or, or are you? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, what we what we do, as I showed on the presentation, is really taking this systematic approach. We, first of all, before we even look at um, a specific variety, we do market segmentation. We analyze the market that we are working in. Uh, we assess the value chain. And we look at what uh, specifically the markets need and what the farmers need. And uh, we do work on uh, open pollinated varieties uh, simply because that's just the nature of the uh, environment in places where we work in. Um, and we run those against profiles. And um, the way we, we, we assess uh, what to look for is, of course, we go um, to the NARS, we go to the CG, we go to private sector. And these are the things that we are looking at. We're looking for, for example, if we're talking about soybean, we have specific needs for protein level, we have specific needs for oil content and other things. And we run a very systematic uh, target product profile and we have this advancement assessments for varieties that specifically meet those needs. Uh, and that, those are the ones that make it to the next level. And of course, uh, we of course assess uh, different elements along the value chain and make sure that uh, those varieties can make it to the next level, level depending upon what we're looking at or what the market needs. So we do drop varieties along the way, but of course we do advance varieties, making sure that they will be successful in getting into the market. Thank you, Tony. And uh, another question for you. Um, this came from Tawanda Muzingi, um, asking um, how you are using a climate lens to prioritize investments in your portfolio, especially agribusiness services and insurance. Yeah, great question. Um, so as I mentioned, um, uh, climate smart, resilient agriculture is embedded in our strategy. So all our portfolio, what we call our portfolio items, essentially all the programs that we're working on, um, have that at the core of what they do. Um, and of course, we do not advance programs if they do not meet uh, elements of uh, what I call CSRA or what we call CSRA. Uh, specifically around our agri services, which I think is uh, what Tawanda is asking. So 
our agri services uh, stream pretty much works on supporting, well, developing and supporting uh, agri entrepreneurs through a hub model. So um, a hub is basically a, a, a lead farmer who's an entrepreneur and is able to aggregate farmers within the community and be able to bring solutions to them, uh, whether it's uh, through um, uh, inputs, whether it's through uh, soil health, whether it's through advisory services, um, whether it's through market linkages. So the way we work uh, within the framework of agri-services, of course, is to incorporate elements of climate smart, resilient agriculture, whether it's supporting um, minimum tillage conservation agricultural practices, uh, use of inputs um, and, and, and elements that would support farmers to embed uh, these climate smart um, ideas into the farming um, uh, practices. And on the insurance side is where now we are developing uh, index-based insurance solutions, among others. Uh, for those who may have had, uh, we did develop or incubate what is now Eka Africa, which is uh, an insurance uh, firm that's based in Kenya. And so those are the solutions and those are the areas we work in to support um, uh, this climate uh, smart and resilient space. Hey, thanks so much, Tony. Uh, so I have a question here from Mark, uh, and this comes from Haile Rodolfa. And the question is, is it time to consider minor crops for improvement in specific localities as minor crops survived climate change over the centuries? And I'm wondering if you could comment on that, Mark. Sure. So I would say yes, absolutely. And this is one thing is um, we are actually working with African Orphan Crop uh, Consortium. Uh, there's a there's in, really important to be thinking about systems based approaches at the local level and in, having rotations of crops that are using indigenous crops and, and systems that are going to be best adapted for those farmers. Um, and sometimes what we really need to get focused on is what can we do um, to improve those crops, at, those minor crops at the, at, that are going to be used at the local level. And I get really excited as we talk about the potential going forward because now with the advances of breeding being so much better than they were, let's say, 20 years ago from the standpoint of understanding what we're doing and being so uh, precise about it, um, you know, a small lab of three people can do something quite revolutionary with gene editing and finding some particular uh, solution for something. And this can be empowered in local, um, uh, let's say NARS uh, could get, get started on this. So as you think forward, to, you know, the next 20 years or next 40 years of this, I think the possibilities are unlimited and we really just need to figure out how do we unlock that potential and use that. Um, so by no means do I think that we should be focused only on one crop or just the main, main crops. But again, there's always this challenge of the resources to do it and who's actually going to pay for it. And this is where we run into these challenges about um, aspirations versus reality of what we can do. But absolutely, I think we need to um, be working on those areas. And I think that there's such commonality across all crops in, in using these advanced genetic tools to make improvements that we really need to tap into that. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, another question for you um, from John Schicitano, who mm -hmm. asked if you could compare or contrast your work in East versus West Africa, where the markets and demand for improved seed are quite different. Can you comment on that? Yeah, well, thank you, John. That's a really good question. And this is where we get into that um, there's a lot of commonality across all of Africa or any low and middle income countries of the barriers that they're facing and the challenges that they have from an individual farmer standpoint. But then, um, you know, I, I think about it, I grew up on a farm in Iowa and actually those are the same problems that you need. You need good quality seed that's gonna be adapted to your locations, that's gonna add value on your farm that makes sense to, to plant. And so those basic fundamentals are the same, but then what you realize is that you're in a system within this about how is it delivered, who's de developing, where is the market demand, and this is where we see the disparities or differences between countries within Africa and East Africa in general has a seed systems uh, history that's perhaps a little bit more developed than in West Africa as far as progress on that. So the private sector is less, um, you know, less engaged, I would say, in West Africa at this stage, but opening up there. And uh, we're seeing countries in West Africa really recognizing the importance of, uh, of creating that enabling environment. So this is where I think that there's huge opportunities from a policy standpoint for governments to focus on 
how it is they create that enabling environment for a virtuous cycle of improvement becoming, and it isn't gonna come just from the private sector, it comes from all of these partners coming in together. But in general, I would say West Africa has had uh, perhaps less, um, uh, less historical investment in that area than in East Africa, if you wanted to generalize in general. And so we're perhaps a, a bit further along in the process in, in East Africa than we are in West Africa. Great, thank you. And if I could ask one more for you, Mark. Um, this is um, from Ida Yamaswari, um, mm -hmm. asking how did you engage the smallholder farmers initially to develop your products? Very good question, Ida. And I would say that this is where the connection with the NARS is really uh, so valuable. Um, and as Jeff was saying, you know, the, they are the ones that have the best connection with the local level, the knowledge of that. And so one of the great things about working on this Kayla Maze project is all those NARS partners um, and also with ADF. These, these are people that grew up on smallholder farms that came from farms within Africa. So the people that I'm, we're working with actually have you know, personal experience and connection with those. Um, but then there's also that ability to reach out through those NARS to connect with them. Um, and this is why I emphasize the importance of defining the product concept at the very beginning phase, because um, there's a lot of effort that needs to be put in that before you start, you need to know where you wanna end up. Uh, and knowing what the farmer needs is really the essence of what you're doing in plant breeding. Um, there's no point of doing plant breeding if you're creating something that the farmer can't need or doesn't want. So, <clears throat> so I think that that, that process has been uh, incorporated and we continually circle back and say, if you're gonna create a pipeline of products coming forward, you have to have a, a cycle of feedback that's coming from the customers, the farmers, um, to give you an idea of what it is they need next. What is it the most uh, pressing problem that they have? And honestly, sometimes the most pressing problems they have are not actually the product, the performance per se. It's more about the access to it, the price of it, the availability, the, whether it's uh, they can trust that it's fake seed or not. So there's a multitude of challenges to face there. But getting that connection with that farmer uh, on, in each of the countries is so vital to being able to find the solutions for it. So um, it's, it's an absolute central part of what we need to do and do, uh, do try to do. Um, and I want to commend um, Simit on that. Um, the, the CGIAR has done a really a lot of work on that uh, aspect of it and bringing in the gender piece of it as well. So um, the opportunities to really get gender-driven decision-making in the product design phase is really important in this process. And so working with the NARS and the 1CG have really helped us do that because I would say that um, private sector um, we do that in our large commercial markets. We know our customers very well, but the truth of the matter is, is that many times in uh, low and middle income countries, those uh, smallholder farmers are not um, close customers of ours. We don't have that relationship. So the partnership really can help bring that um, connection together with that, that helps us as a private sector to be more sensitive uh, to the needs of the, of the smallholder farmer as well. So there's a lot of synergies that go around with these partnerships if we um, keep our mind open of what it is that we need and how we um, capitalize on the strengths of each of the partners. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, so a couple of questions came in around the topic of soil health. And so I think several of, several of the panelists could um, respond to this. And then there was a specific one directed to Nora. So I'll just read first, Michael Gabriel asked, when breeding for heat and drought aridity, do breeders also take into account worsened soil biomes and other aspects of poor soil? And then related to that, um, there was a question about regenerative agriculture and soil health and the role that they'll have in the global food security strategy as it seems to be a focus in the draft. So um, I guess anyone who, who can come on and speak to soil health, and then maybe Nora could talk a bit about how that plays into the, the strategy. So I, I, I can take a stab at it first, perhaps, and then, look. but I, so I will say that soil health is probably one of the most important things for drought tolerance. So I, I led actually the introduction of the drought trait here in the United States uh, and, and have been working on this drought issue in maize for many years. 
And the first thing you have to stop and think about is, okay, what's your water, what's your water use efficiency and how much water do you have? Well, the water that you have is related to how much your water holding capacity of your soil is. So if you have a sandy soil, you have a real problem. And so building organic matter is really fundamental to this. Also, tillage practices are huge. So when you till the soil, you've got to remember that you're releasing all sorts of not only carbon, but you're also releasing water, moisture. So tillage is a big problem that if you're doing too much tillage, you're actually losing your water. Use. So I, I can't emphasize enough how important if you're going to deal with drought tolerance and this whole thing that you really have to have soils as your primary thing that you're doing and figure out what it is you can do to maximize the amount of water that can be held in the soil and that you, you minimize the amount of transpiration uh, that's going on out of the soils. So um, absolutely central to it. Um, and that's a really complex question about how do you improve the soils. But I would say any practice that is going to help reduce tillage um, is usually going to be there. And, and actually, this is one of the things that I find quite frustrating in Africa is, is that they have poor soils, and yet they're doing um, a, a lot, large amount of tillage, and they're doing it with hoes by hand. So not only is it losing soil moisture, it's drudgery work, and it really needs to be rethought about how it is that we help smallholder farmers manage their soils um, and maintain soil moisture to avoid the drought problems. So um, it's a really good question, um, but not one that really gets solved often by genetics. It's really more about um, through the agronomic practice that we have to put together and that whole system that we build to, to think about a systems-based approach. Great, really excellent points, Mark. I don't know if other speakers wanted to add anything on this question. If I, if I can add, I think there's also a great point uh, in the Q&A from Naomi Sakane, which is, which is on how we bring farmers and farmers networks into this, because I think often we learn a lot about soil health and the interaction between varieties, crop management uh, and performance from, from the, the learnings of, of the farmers, farming communities. Uh, and I think there's, there's a lot to be gained from, from working at that interface as well from using that knowledge as, as the, the launching pad for understanding how we can optimize optimize some of these management interventions uh, with our varieties, you know, with, with those whole packages. I don't know, Nora, did you want to come in from the USAID perspective? Yeah, thank you very much. I think that question came from Robert. Thank you, Robert. And I see that you have read the draft um, annotated outline of the research strategy and you are right this is one of the three research themes that we're focusing on in the research strategy and it falls under sustainable and efficient methods for climate smart agriculture so we're looking at um, um, agriculture production systems in this particular theme and one of the things that we're emphasizing is improving soil health. We are now um, understanding more that when we return organic matter to the soil, that really not only uh, increases uh, crop yield, but it, it also improves the ability of the soil to sequester uh, carbon. So, and there are many innovative approaches that can that we would like to consider as we develop methods of projects under that research theme. For example, uh, some of the um, things that some of our innovation labs are doing is um, um, using the applying biochar in the soil of um, in African countries where they work in uh, my, micro Soil microbiome is another very interesting area that could really help in in this particular um, in in improving soil health. So thank you. Thank you, Nora. Uh, and um, our next question, I uh, this could be answered by a number of you, maybe Allison or Mark. Um, Chinta Mani Dimal asked about fall armyworm and how it's uh, widely spreading and affecting corn globally. And just a question about fall resistant varieties available with CIMIT or any measures to manage fall. Uh, yeah. 
Go ahead, Allison. Yeah, and just just to highlight that I, I put in the question and answer um, a new guide on integrated pest management for full army worm, which was produced by USAID, Feed the Future, and Simit. Uh, and so this is really um, documenting and, and synthesizing all of those the the available technologies, uh, and also a link to the the recent Simit derived hybrids for Africa, which might be be of interest. But hand over to Mark to, to carry on. Yeah, okay. Well, well thank you, Allison. Um, so when it comes to fall armyworm, this is a new pest that came into Africa and it spread across Africa and now into Asia since uh, 2017, I think it was, it came in. It's a new pest. It's been dealt with a lot in the Americas, uh, Central America and in North America for many years. Um, one of the key things to keep in mind is it really takes an integrated pest management approach. There isn't one solution to this. Um, and there's a lot of natural things that can and should be done to control it and, and are being done, uh, natural predators that are used. Um, then there's, of course, the pesticides that can be used, and then there's um, genetic improvements. So CIMIC has released some lines that are bred for um, conventional braiding through you know, that have better resistance or tolerance to the fall armyworm. And then we have the BT traits that have uh, been shown and proven to, to be able to completely con or control the, the fall armyworm quite effectively if used in, a, in a, an appropriate way with an integrated pest management approach. So um, the key here is really trying to reduce the amount of pesticides that are needed to use and use an integrated system to really address that. And there's a combination of things, but um, this is one of the reasons that we're seeing that the BT traits in this in the Taylor Maze project are actually yielding so substantially better than the non-GM um, Tago hybrids is because if the fall armyworm comes in, the added protection there that you have just has a dramatic impact on the yield. I uh, didn't show you some of the most dramatic ones, but I've seen sometimes where it's 100% yield difference. Um, so it's a big challenge out there with fall armyworm, no, no single solution. Um, and we really need to let evidence and science, science decision-making process in, involved in what's the best way to handle it at the local level. Great, thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one or two more questions. I, I have another one here that I think maybe Tony could answer, and it's around um, the roles of seed scientists in our quest to improve crops and ensure food security in a changing climate. Tony, maybe you could speak to how seed scientists um, are involved in this. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think I'd answer the question. So the way I see it, um, so we take this uh, demand-led approach or the demand-led breeding approach, whereby uh, we're, we, we are involving um, small-scale farmers in the decision-making process, understanding the needs and the requirements of farmers, but at the same time, um, thinking about the environment in which they are operating in, I talked about the um, the partnership with Simit to look at um, drought tolerant maize varieties. Um, those are the traits that we need to be incorporating into the breeding lines um, when we start thinking about bringing in new varieties to the market. We also look at existing varieties in the market and seeing how we can improve them. Um, not necessarily bringing in brand new varieties to the market because farmers are very sensitive to investing in something that they haven't used before, but we could improve what we have in the market today through um, different elements of breeding um, to bring in resistance to diseases, as an example, um, uh, drought tolerance, as an example, as well. But I think that's the role that they need to, they need to place to look uh, far ahead. And the way we look at it as seeds to be is to have these constant feedback loops to provide feedback back to, to the breeding uh, 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 programs on what's working and what's not working. So their role is to really look um, broadly um, towards what the farmers want and of course the environment that these varieties need to make um, or rather to, 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 to work in where the farmers are. Great, thank you so much, Tony. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I, I, another question here for Mark, actually, um, around just sort of GM crops and market resistance. Um, what can you say about um, Bayer's efforts to increase market acceptability? Yeah, well, thanks for the question. I, I know that some, with some audiences, it's a, a 
very um, polarizing question, I guess, and that we need to really try to um, balance the, the science and the evidence versus the um, misconceptions and the misunderstandings that there are out there and get to a common understanding about what is GM technology. So we are we do a lot to reach out to uh, various audiences working through um, these stakeholders. So under the you know the Taylor Mays partnership, all of those folks getting everybody comfortable with this about what is GM technology and how can it be used and um, help try to stop getting it positioned as everybody um, as a silver bullet for all of the problems. It's really one more tool in the toolbox. Um, and it may actually become obsolete as we move into gene editing and move forward into more precision sort of thing. So it's this um, possibility to bring in traits that are specific for a specific issue. So if we think about, you know, the insects with fall armyworm, that BT gene came from soil bacteria that the organic um, industry uses and sprays on plants to control their insects. So they simply created a new delivery mechanism of that same um, biological protein and said, we'll put it in the plant so that every cell in the plant has that same protein that then it, it, it controls this particular set of insects. So it's actually very ecologically sound um, because there's so much less pesticides that are used. But that sort of conversation and, and nuance of the conversation is hard to get through to audiences because there's a really a lot of technical stuff that gets involved in and misunderstandings. So we just need to make sure that we reach out to people open and say, well, what is it that you don't understand or what is it that you are your concerns about this and be open to this and say, listen, it's up to we, what we're really all about is trying to get farmers to have the choice, help farmers have the choice. And if it adds value to that farmer and the farmer, then, then that farmer can make the decision for themselves of whether this works. And there's plenty of evidence to show that the environmental benefits of this technology are, are um, well documented as, as positive. Um, and the farmers have come back and purchased it. So those sorts of things that messages need to get through, but we also need to try to um, depolarize the conversation and say, if you're opposed to it, that you're wrong, if there's a right or a wrong, it's not an either or, it's a both and um, approach that we need. And we just need to continue to reach out and communicate and be open to um, feedback and, and, and direction on how is it that we um, help people understand how it fits into an, an integrated holistic system. So it's a it's a really complicated challenge, um, and I welcome anybody's uh, feedback and input on that and support as well as we go forward to try to get to making evidence based decision making with that um, and and take out some of the emotion that gets into it. So that's that's my attempt at least. Out of time, so I just wanted to take a moment and really thank all of the speakers for these excellent presentations. And on behalf of the USAID team, I want to emphasize um, thanks for the the those of you who contributed to the chat and the Q and A. This kind of discussion is really informative for us as we um, plan our our programming going forward. And lastly, I just want to close by noting that February is Research for Food Security um, Month on AgriLinks. Um, so please um, take a moment to, to check out the AgriLinks website. You can register and, and um, submit uh, a post, um, and that would be um, really uh, appreciated as well. So thanks, everyone, and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.